beginning with our first speaker, Colonel Tony Pfaff is a foreign area officer for the Middle East and North Africa, current, currently serving on the policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State. He received his bachelor's degree in philosophy and economics from Washington and Lee, master's degrees from Stanford and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and a Ph.D. from Georgetown University. Colonel Pfaff has had a distinguished career in the Army prior to moving to the State Department. He served as the defense attache in Baghdad, the chief of international military affairs for CENTCOM, def and defense attache in Kuwait, and he is a veteran of operations Iraqi Freedom, Desert Shield, and Desert Storm. Colonel Pfaff has also taught philosophy at West Point. Uh, he is the author of many articles on precisely our topic, including risk, military ethics and irregular warfare, military ethics in complex contingencies, ethics in dangerous situations, bungee jumping off the moral high ground, the ethics of espionage in the modern age, toward uh, an ethics of detention and, and interrogation, aligning means and ends toward a new way of war, and chaos, complexity, and the modern battlefield. He's also published several monographs with the Strategic Studies Institute, such as Resolving Ethical Dilemmas in Combating Irregular Threats. And he has served as a consultant for the independent panel to review DOD detention procedures headed by former Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger. His topic today is the dilemmas of wars among the peoples, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Please welcome Tony Pfaff. Good morning. How are you guys after last night? Probably, hopefully, better than I am, but we'll see. Actually, last night was great because I had the opportunity to talk to a few folks, and the topic came up. You know, what didn't you get yesterday that you were looking for today? One person said, well, you know, I'd really like to have some case studies I can use in my JRTC classes. I'm thinking, oh, cool, I got case studies. I can do that. And then someone else said, well, you know, the presentations yesterday were really great, but they weren't funny. Uh, and I thought... <laughs> Boy, are you in for a treat, <laughs> because uh, I hate PowerPoint, and I wasn't going to do PowerPoint, but I kind of wanted to score the power of culture, and among my people, you can't speak without having a PowerPoint. We don't know how, uh, but because I also wanted to demonstrate the power of subversion, I wanted to, uh, uh, I, 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 I didn't want to make these slides entirely too useful. Uh, so I also was thinking, I'm supposed to be up here and talk 30 to 45 minutes, that's a long time for me. Normally, I'm on a panel for about 10 minutes. I say, you know, I, I say nonsense for 10 minutes, and people ask a bunch of questions. I, I don't know what, how to talk necessarily for 45 minutes. And I figured, as much as I adore the sound of my own voice, you may not share that sentiment. So I thought I'd also kind of add a little entertainment and, uh, and try to throw a couple of cartoons in, occasional useful slide that will sort of, I, I will try to tie into the topic of the day. And I picked this slide. Uh, because I think it kind of actually captures the U.S. military's attitude towards counterinsurgency, irregular warfare, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, based on our really positive experiences in Vietnam, we dropped it as fast as we possibly could in favor of fighting Russians in the Fulda Gap. Uh, and uh, only, picked it up, only picked it back up again when failure to do so would have just led to a bigger mess. So with that, what I'm going to talk about today is the dilemmas that we associate with population-centric warfare. And I'm calling it population-centric warfare. Uh, 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 it's, just, it's just the same thing as war amongst the peoples, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, while I'm not going to fully account for all the frustrations uh, we and other forces have experienced uh, in these conflicts, I'm going to try to describe the dynamics that give rise to these dilemmas suggest implications they have for fighting population-centric wars. And to do that, I'm first going to describe some dilemmas, then I'm going to discuss the difference between what I'm going to call forest-centric warfare and population-centric warfare. Uh, then I'm going to discuss, because this is about ethics, I'm going to discuss the role of norms in, 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 in how these dilemmas arise. And then I'm going to discuss ways that we can uh, uh, a way out, uh, if possible, uh, of these dilemmas. So that's sort of the roadmap. Uh, that I'm going to uh, follow. Um, but first, before I get too far into that, a short note about terms. 
Uh, so I'm going to be distinguishing between force centric warfare and population centric warfare. I'm going to identify force centric warfare with regular warfare and population centric warfare with irregular warfare, uh, which allows me to link these ideas to a broader analysis in, uh, of war fighting. So I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. And my point here is not to argue that there may not be other forms of war that share these characteristics, or more importantly for our discussion, that any particular war may not have elements of both. Uh, and I'm not going to argue that population-centric doesn't involve force, or force-centric warfare doesn't involve paying attention to the population. But what I am going to argue is that the victory conditions associated with these two kinds of warfare are different, and this has important implications for how these wars should be fought. All right, so this story begins with a conversation about rules of engagement. After assuming control of coalition forces in Afghanistan, uh, Lieutenant General Stanley McChrystal adopted rules of engagement that imposed significant limits on collateral damage U.S. combatants could risk in the conduct of operations, even if it meant sometimes going, uh, foregoing operations against insurgents. As he said, it's better to let a few insurgents escape than alienate the Afghan public by inflicting civilian casualties. These rules reflected the belief articulated in the U.S. Army and Marine Corps' manual, FM 33, Counterinsurgency Manual 3-24, that collateral damage undermined efforts to build popular support away from the Taliban and, build, and bring it towards the coalition. And in this view, protecting the population would eventually lead to victory over insurgent forces. Now, for the case studies. Shortly after those new, new rules went into effect, a uh, Marine Corps company commander was viewing images on an uh, unmanned aerial system, uh, and he spotted four men planning what appeared to be an improvised explosive device. He considered calling it an airstrike, but then he noticed some children playing nearby. Uh, so he kept the drone over, uh, was watching them, and as the kids wandered away, he decided to call in the strike. But no sooner had he done that than the children wandered back. So he's figured it out. These kids, the, these insurgents are using kids as basically human shields because uh, they never were able to, they never got too far away from the insurgents. So the captain concluded that the insur uh, so after 45 minutes, he decided just to call off the attack and rather the higher headquarters later sent an, I an ordnance disposal site to clear the IED before the convoy, convoy came through. This is not an isolated example. In another instance, a higher headquarters denied a Marine patrol permission to attack an apparent insurgent group that seemed to be emplacing roadside bombs along a convoy route. The evidence that, they were, uh, th that the Afghans at work on the roadside were insurgents seemed overwhelming. It was a great location for an IED. Uh, they possessed wire and canisters and other paraphernalia associated with IEDs. They had a recent radio intercept saying that there were insurgents that were uh, planning IEDs in the area. But they were digging in an area that was close to the civilian population. And the only means they had of getting at the insurgents was helicopters uh, and, 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 and machine gun fire from a distance. It would, almost would have certainly led to civilian casualties. In fact, it was, even, it was likely that even if the men who appeared to be playing the ID were, were in fact insurgents, their deaths would have just been portrayed as innocent civilians doing routine work. For all those reasons, and likely some others, the Marines higher headquarters refused permission to engage. Frustrated, the lieutenant uh, angrily exclaimed, I thought we were playing by big boy rules. Now, thankfully, in both cases, no Marines, no children, or other civilians were harmed. Unfortunately, neither were any of the enemy. Uh, so the frustrated lieutenant was kind of right to focus on the rules, which kind of feel to do what rules are supposed to do, guide our action in a way that aligns our interests. But it's a paradox of counterinsurgency that often the more force one employs, the less effective it will be, which is sort of the guiding assumption of these judgments. But it's also a fact of counterinsurgency and warfare of all kinds, employing no force is just as ineffective as well. As one Marine who was present in the first example reportedly stated, we have to separate the insurgents from the people. If we just bomb the hell out of everything, we'll have a hard time doing that. The difficulty with that approach is that if no one bombs nothing, one bombs nothing or, or no one, then the threat to the population and the Marines never seems to go away. Thus, it is possible to learn the wrong lesson from this paradox, the wrong lesson being never use force. In fact, failure to risk any collateral damage has generated a number of these apparent dilemmas where combatants are forced to choose between excessive risk to themselves and excessive risk to non-combatants, often settling for courses of action that pose little or no risk to the enemy. Uh, uh, another couple examples are while receiving mortar fire during an overnight mission, an Army sergeant reportedly requested elimination rounds so that his unit could see the enemy's location better. Uh, that was denied by the higher headquarters because the canister, you know, could fall on the town under you know, where the enemy were, uh, were firing from uh, and lead to casualties. He also reported being denied smoke rounds to obscure his movement while under fire for the same reason. And I'll talk a little bit more about resolving these later on. But, um, but you know, on the other hand, and this is the dilemma part, 
uh, kinetic operations, uh, using force, you know, comes with its own set of problems. Kinetic operations may maximize risk to insurgents, but they also seem to increase, if not maximize, risk to counterinsurgents, or at least the ends they're trying to achieve. This dynamic suggests another paradox of counterinsurgency. The more one protects one's force, typically by relying on overwhelming firepower that insurgents can't match, or remaining on fortified bases, limiting contact with the population and thus risk, the less secure these forces often are. In fact, the emphasis on destroying insurgent elements by U.S. forces in 2003 to 2004 is often credited with the rise of the insurgency in Iraq and the ability of al-Qaeda uh, to move freely and gain support for its own op presence and operations. That experience, in fact, drove the development of the counterinsurgency doctrine that informed the rules of the engagement mentioned above. I also want to point out these frustrations aren't new. Uh, 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 1968, in the wake of the Tet Offensive, about 2,500 Viet Cong had entrenched themselves in the town of Ben Tre, about 18,000 folks, and had dug themselves into the town with barricades, mines, and booby traps, which led to significant casualties by South Vietnamese and U.S. forces when they tried to retake the town. After those attempts stalled, American officials decided that the enemy and civilian populations were so intertwined, there was no real effective way to separate them. So to drive the enemy out, ground forces supported by airstrikes and artillery attacked the town. And while they're able to retake it, they destroyed 50% of the town's houses and damaged many of the remaining 2,000 structures. Allied forces lost 100 ki 101 killed and 242 wounded. The uh, Viet Cong lost about 300, but more than 1,000 civilians were also were reportedly killed. That level of destruction, in fact, inspired the quote, uh, we had to destroy the town to save it, which uh, reporter Peter Arnett attributed to an unnamed U.S. Army major, who I think was later named. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, and this is one of those interesting cases because the operation was a tactical success. However, it's a little, and it's a little more difficult to assess its, you know, its strategic impact. But a number of sources have linked that battle, as well as the quote, uh, to uh, increased support for the anti-war effort in the United States, which eventually undermined the strategic impact these tactical successes uh, could have had. As one, uh, as, 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 as one scholar noted, as one uh, survey noted, actually, if we really had to destroy our friends in order to save them, was the effort really worth it, either for us or for our friends? And this point suggests the importance of one's actions harmonizing with other moral commitments one has made, or at least the larger narrative that counts for why one is fighting. And nor are these frustrations limited to U.S. forces. The Israelis experienced the same thing. During the 2000 to 2005 Intifada, where they used kinetic operations um, uh, to limit terrorist attacks uh, coming out of the Gaza Strip, um, uh, 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 they ended up destroying the Palestinian economy, which then pushed many Palestinians closer to Hamas. In 2014, in the conf conflict with Hamas in the Gaza Strip, uh, their, the IDF's reliance on kinetic operations, though carefully directed at Hamas targets, seemed to empower Hamas rather than degrade its ability to conduct operations. This outcome arises because Hamas, like the other groups I've already mentioned, keeps civilians close when they operate. These groups consistently use schools, residential buildings, mosques, and hospitals as a site from which to conduct operation. Further, many of these same civilians provide various kinds of support, uh, from reporting on friendly activity to sheltering insurgent fighters. These practices not only make it more difficult for friendly forces to target the militants, um, they, also, uh, 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 they also paradoxically build support for those militants, even or especially when civilians are killed. In fact, uh, particularly in, in, in Palestine, the civilian deaths have had the effect of rallying locals as well as members of the international community to their cause because these groups are able to place these casualties in a narrative weak versus strong where the presumption of justice often favors the weak. As a result, local international pressure on the stronger power, in this case Israel, to cease operations increases. Um, uh, however, because Hamas benefits from Israeli strikes this way, Israel's simply ceasing operations does not end the rocket attacks. Rather, this cycle typically ends when Israel has conceded something to Hamas that allows them to claim that, risks, that the risk Hamas leaders took on Palestinians' behalf was worth it. So paradoxically, by putting Palestinians at risk, Hamas is better able to achieve, achieve its objectives. And we've seen something similar in Afghanistan, where the majority of civilians' casualties occur at the hands of the Taliban, but they seem to keep getting stronger. And this point just suggests that the relationship between civilian ca casualties and winning is neither uh, simple nor symmetric. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now let's talk about dilemmas. The dilemma is a situation where one has equally good or bad reasons to select each of two mutually exclusive options. Now in the cases that I've just described, combatants certainly have good reasons to attack the enemy. But 
uh, population-centric warfare, the use of force, even if discriminate, can work more to the enemy's benefit than to his harm. On the other hand, combatants have equally good reasons to engage the people, to win their hearts and minds, which is, as we are told, the surest path to victory. However, that approach can leave the enemy capability relatively untouched and allows him the freedom, of a mo a, a freedom he needs to pursue his own interests and objectives unimpeded. And this puts people in the middle of a fight that no one can seem to win. And even if the enemy never becomes strong enough to take on regular forces in head-on-head -head battle, the fight doesn't seem to end. This dilemma dynamic thus creates what I'll call a crisis of norms by forcing combatants to accept disproportionate and self-defeating risk relative to the enemy. Now, by norms, I'm needing, I, I, I mean those general principles that guide our practical and ethical decisions, in this case, about warfighting. Not simply those that are uh, 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 yeah, about warfighting. In this context, the norms tell us what we should do if we want to fight wars well. As such, they include both the practical and ethical aspects of warfighting, since fighting wars well entail winning, but, and we'll talk about this, without sacrificing our other moral commitments. And what I'm going to argue is that demands of regular warfare throw our traditions of norms of war, our traditional norms of war, off balance, which gives rise to these dilemmas. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is the difference between regular and irregular warfare. Now, as the British strategist Colin Gray notes, uh, what counts as regular and irregular is, sort, is somewhat arbitrary and based on a decision by any particular security community about uh, how it confronts their dominant threat. So in regular war, as it's least practiced in the West, uh, that choice is driven by the idea of the enemy as an existential threat against, one, against whom one must impose one's will to preserve the community and the state. Now, the logic of regular war is simple in expression, though often uh, difficult in application. One has imposed one's will successfully when the enemy no longer has the capacity to resist. One eliminates the enemy's capacity to resist by eliminating their combat capability faster than they can eliminate one's own. Doing this requires a strategy of annihilation, or at least attrition, uh, that seeks head-to-head -head battle aimed at brute force objectives, such as seizing territory or destroying as much as the enemy forces as possible. Um, normatively, executing such a strategy requires, or at least encourages, combatants to use as much force as possible, though as I'll discuss later, uh, there are lim our other commitments will limit what's permissible. The problem is this normative framework uh, isn't stable. Separating military from civilian is motivated by the normative ideal, drawing on Victor Davis Hansen here, of head-to-head -head combat that drives the regular response to regular war. Open battle favors the stronger side, and by separating civilian from the military, in terms of what may be permissibly targeted, the norms of regular war make the vulnerable aspects of society off limits to attack, placing the weaker side in its own kind of dilemma, where it must choose between open battle and defeat, or if they remain true to the norms, limited attacks on military and, gover and government targets, leading to stalemate, if not defeat. So this dynamic incentivizes the weaker side to abandon the norms associated with regular war and attract the stronger side where it is most vulnerable, which is typically civilian targets. In fact, this dynamic not only encourages targeting civilians, it also encourages irregular forces to become civilian or civilian in nature to avoid, to avoid being targeted. In such conflicts, as Rupert Smith notes in his book, Utility of Force, uh, which given the title of the speech I had to quote, uh, the loyalties, attitudes, and quality of life of the people do not simply impact the outcome, they determine it. This point is important as it suggests that insurgent success, success depends on indirect means, avoiding direct contact with, uh, uh, with opposing forces and controlling the population. This point further suge suggests um, uh, 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 that counterinsurgent forces should also choose indirect strategies that target insurgent leadership and challenge their ability to control and hide behind the population. Uh, examples of this would be Operation Phoenix, which targeted Viet Cong leadership associated with the shadow government. They imposed in areas where they could, um, and uh, as well as the Strategic Hamlet program, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And for the most part, this uh, response to regular war has been generally successful, because it's not just U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan that have been frustrated by regular foes. In fact, according to a survey of armed conflict from 1808 to 1998, significantly weaker adversaries defeated stronger ones approximately 30 percent of the time. In particular, in asymmetric conflicts, which the report defined as conflicts where the force ratio was greater than 5 to 1, not only were there surprising numbers of weaker side successes, but the frequency of those successes increased over time. In fact, from 1950 to 1998, weaker actors in asymmetric con con uh, conflicts succeeded in the majority, 55 out of 90, of the conflicts surveyed. So what accounts for this success? 
Well, the blending of military and civilians shifts the emphasis from brute force objectives that entail destructions of the enemy's capacity to resist to what I'll call compliance objectives that are intended to convince or coerce an adversarial leadership and population to accommodate a particular interest. The difficulty with this latter war aim is that it entails a gap between political and military ends that doesn't exist with brute force objectives. With brute force objectives, the destruction of the enemy's military capabilities are sufficient to achieve the political objective, such as regime destruction or territory seizure. However, there's no necessary connection between attaining military objectives and coercing or otherwise convincing an adversary to change his behavior. This dynamic suggests that success in this regard, this is another thing that kind of complicates regular warfare, uh, it can entail different kinds of outcomes because it's not just about who surrenders. Success could count as a negotiated settlement where some but not all interests are accommodated. So it becomes much more complex to define. But El Salvador serves as a good example of this where after a brutal civil war, both the government and communist insurgents made concessions. According to the 1992 Chapultepec Peace Accords, armed forces regulated, a civilian police force was established, and the, uh, uh, the guerrillas transformed from a guerrilla army to a political party uh, were given amnesty in 1993. And additionally, the government undertook land reform measures that addressed some of the popular grievances that drove the conflict, but the government stayed there. So uh, discussions about, that's why I think in terms of regular war, sometimes success is the right category to assess more than, uh, uh, rather than, you know, victory at least in regular terms. But the problem here is that the more, so the point is that the more compliance dependent the objective, the more difficult it is to translate that objective into operational military ones, to links between the battlefield military effectiveness and strategic success. More importantly, uh, it is much more difficult to discern how much force or other measures are required to change people's minds. And that can place the regular opponents more in control of the outcome of the conflict since they get to decide how much tolerance for suffering they have. And that'll be an important point we pick up later. Now I want to, now I want to talk a little bit the role of narrative, because I think that's what, the, what fills this gap between the political and the military. Uh, objectives is uh, the narrative in which various audiences perceive military and political acts where audiences can mean anyone who's affected by or can affect the outcome of the conflict. In this context, force is not simply a destructive means to attrit the enemy. Rather, and uh, I highly recommend Emil Simpson's War from the Ground Up, where he makes a great argument and has wonderful examples about the use of the, uh, how force is a language of war that links the use of force to political meaning. And the, so the path to that success then is found in aligning that language with the narrative that makes one's political uh, objectives intelligible. Now, as philosopher Alastair McIntyre argued in his classic After Virtue, narratives not only make our actions intelligible, they unify these actions with our other moral commitments uh, or let us know when we stray. As he asserts, to answer the question, what am I to do, I have to answer the prior question of what stories am I a part in regular war, a simple example of a narrative might be the enemy has committed an act of aggression against which we are defending ourselves. And not only does this explain why we kill, but also how act killing ties into our notions of states and individual rights. Q next slide. Um, so this is a quick summary of the differences between, or I'm arguing between regular and irregular warfare. Uh, and kind of what I want to talk about now is, so how do those differences give rise to uh, uh, the, these, uh, these dilemmas as well as, uh, these normative dilemmas as well as a way out. But it's not hard to see that um, as the categories of things that demand military attention proliferate, we discussed in irregular warfare, uh, how normative decision gets more complicated. Now, the norms of war begin with the utilitarian, the norms of war begin with the utilitarian imperative to defeat the enemy, uh, justified in terms of the justice one's victory would serve. The imperative of this defeat thus lends its moral force to the specific missions assigned to combatants intended to bring about the enemy's demise, identifying for us those actions which are justified by military necessity. By morally enabling specific missions, this imperative enables the combatants permissions to kill while at the same time obligating them to risk their lives. Now, all that is just for this triangle. Um, but that's a, the point of that what, very simple picture is just to show that these are the norms that they're trading off. You're always trying to find a balance. And we, and I'll t pick this up later, but when we're making these decisions, we kind of learned yesterday, particularly in Jean's excellent presentation, you know, there's always a tension that, uh, that is uh, very difficult to resolve. And that tension doesn't go away. But 
In terms of these norms, a just war assimilates the practical concerns of war with the ethical by assimilating military necessity and efficiency to the demands of justice. This dynamic yields three competing imperatives, defeating the enemy, avoiding harm to noncombatants, and protecting your force. These norms force trade-offs as commanders have to decide where to place risk. Defeating the enemy puts both combatants and noncombatants at risk. Protecting the force puts defeating the enemy and noncombatants at risk. And minimizing harm to noncombatants puts combatants and defeating the enemy at risk. Like that. Um, my point here is that normative decision making in war really is about finding that balance, about making decisions about risk in order to balance the commitments represented by these uh, imperatives. So in term, determining that balance, it's important to understand that part of the role norms of war play is to harmonize its practice with other moral commitments, especially those that drove us to war in the first place. Put simply, it's self-defeating to fight a just war unjustly. Nothing else, if your actions do not line with your cause, you risk undermining the political support your success depends on. If your story is that, for example, of benign democratizer, that's accompanied by kinetic operations, even discriminate ones, socially disruptive policies, and whatever your intent, an absence of democratic improvements, the locals will doubt your story and find more reasons to line up with insurgents who may be easier to comprehend. However, it can be just as self-defeating to restrain one's ability to fight out of moral sensibilities, especially by doing so, you prolong the conflict, leading to more harm and risk defeat. Neither situation is really stable, and the role of wartime's norms is to find that balance, where you can maintain your moral high ground without bungee jumping, while defeating the enemy at the least cost to yourselves. So here's how it works in a regular war. And the logic of regular war harmonizes the norms with its requirements this way. Military necessity obligates uh, combatants to fight, which requires them to take risks. Since the enemy in regular warfare is an existential threat, combatants must accept existential risk in turn. Since civilians, with a few exceptions, are practically separable uh, from the threat the enemy military imposes or represents, they're immune from harm, the doctrine we refer to as noncombatant immunity. Because noncombatants are immune, combatants must avoid harming them, even if it means taking extra risks to do so, because of something we can talk about later, the moral equivalency of noncombatants. Um, however, that risk is limited. Because defeating the enemy is also a moral imperative, Com combatants are not obligated to take so much risk that they fail or are no longer able to continue fighting. As just war theorist Michael Walzer notes, the limits of risk are fixed, then roughly at the point where any further risk taking would almost certainly doom the military venture or make it so costly that it couldn't be repeated. So when they've reached that limit, combatants may displace risk onto non-combatants within the bounds of the principle, principles of proportionality and discrimination where proportionality simply says avoid more harm than the good achieved by your military objective, and discrimination, which requires combatants to respect the civil, mil the civ civ civil military gap and avoid targeting non-combatants. Now, I think at this point, hopefully, it's not hard to see why regular warfare poses such a challenge. When military and civilian blend to the point of being indistinguishable, combatants have nowhere to, nowhere to go or nowhere to displace risk except onto themselves. Thus, this irregular dynamic terms normative war fighting on its head, at best putting, permitting combatants to pick which way they prefer to lose rather than the best way to win. And that's no way to fight a war. Finding out our way of this mess means finding a balance to these norms that harmonizes with the logic of irregular warfare. What is that? Well, um, where regular forces impose their will on the enemy, irregular forces seek to uh, change that, break that will, changing the adversary's mind, not about resistance, but about cooperation with a particular political order. And where irregular forces are designed to destroy similar forces in open battle, regular forces tend to fight indirectly, using force to message multiple audiences, building support for their cause. And so here I'd like to kind of offer a domestic example that sort of illustrates the, the difference that I'm talking about. Now, in 1992, during the Los Angeles riots, uh, Marines were activated, mobilized to work with the uh, LA police to uh, assist with civil disturbances. They got a call. They went to the building. When they arrived at this apartment where the disturbance was reported, the police knocked on the door and announced themselves. The response from inside the building, inside the room, was a shotgun blast that blew, the door, blew a hole in the door. Fortunately, it didn't hurt anyone. So the police yelled down to the Marines, cover me. The Marines promptly put 200 rounds through that door, uh, uh, as well they should have. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, no one was injured. But I think this, so we won't talk about, mark, I guess there was marksmanship training later that day. Uh, but but um, <laughs> another good question. Uh, um, but I think it actually, it's a good example to sort of illustrate the difference between understandings of necessity, risk, and force protection. 
at least between law enforcement and the military. Though both law enforcement and the military will tell you that you use the least force necessary, they have very different ideas of what necessity entails. By cover me, the police wanted the Marines to withhold their fire, keeping an eye on you know, what's going on, and, uh, and only shoot if it meant to prevent an immediate threat uh, that harm, and to ensure harm to others was avoided and the order preserved. For the Marines, cover me meant lay a base of fire to prevent the threat from maneuvering and materializing in the first place. As long as they limited that force in accordance with the principles of proportionality and discrimination, their use of force from their point of view was appropriate. In doing so, the Marine, uh, they, they maximize risk to the shooter, minimize risk to defend the forces, and limit it to bystanders. So they saw necessity as the most force permissible, where, I will argue, the police tend to see necessity as the least force possible. This also, example also illustrates an important point about collateral risks and harms. It isn't the case that police are never permitted to expose civilians to foreseen risk. But this is different from exposing them to foreseen harm. For example, Police are permitted to engage in a high-speed chase, knowing that somebody could jump out in front or they could lose control of the wheel uh, and somebody could inadvertently get hurt. Um, so that high-speed chase does represent a higher risk to, uh, to, to innocents uh, and bystanders. Uh, the point here, while that risk is foreseen, the harm isn't. There's no necessary connection between driving fast and hitting a pedestrian, as there is between an artillery barrage in a populated area and harm to civilians in the blast radius. So it's one thing to engage in behavior that puts others at risk and behavior that, that, in, that uh, entails a harm. The point about introducing this comparison with law enforcement is that the ends of law enforcement, like preserving civil order, uh, are uh, ensuring safety, are sometimes closer to the ends of irregular warfare, which include building cooperation with the political order, and so can serve as a model for not only what works, but what, what can harmonize the demands of irregular warfare. So now I kind of want to talk a little bit more about the specific rules of irregular warfare and they examine those obligations, permissions, and prohibitions. And this discussion is because if you guys aren't familiar with Calvin Ball, um, I'll give you a second, because sometimes it's going to kind of feel like that. The rules kind of get made up as you go along, and every time somebody makes up a new rule, you have to make up another one. Uh, so, um, so first what I want to look at is, going back to that triangle, the tension between defeating the enemy and force protection and talk about combatant risk and irregular warfare. So as I noted earlier, the moral, the moral basis for the combatant's obligation to accept risk is driven by the relationship combatants have to the non-combatants in question. This is an important point. Our moral obligations significantly depend on the quality and complexity of our relationships. Parents, for example, have obligations to their children that they don't have with other people's children, though that point does not mean they don't have any obligations to any children, anybody else's children. Now, in the case of war, Few people will question a combatant's obligation to risk their lives in defense of their nation and its citizens. In the regular war ideal, when the nation is confronted with an existential threat, combatants take on existential risks, so friendly combatants don't. However, the same ideal acknowledges that this responsibility to protect friendly noncombatants does not necessarily extend to enemy noncombatants. Combatants are certainly required to avoid harming enemy noncombatants, but that often is where the responsibility ends. In irregular warfare, the absence of that existential threat also erodes the obligatory basis for unlimited risk. If the territory and sovereignty of the state aren't threatened, then on what basis can the state demand combatants to risk their lives? It does not help that the population-centric character of irregular forces also, a regular war, confuses that relationship between combatant and non-combatant. In irregular environments, com combatants interact with, and may be called on to defend, civilians who are hostile to the combatant's cause. However, asking a young person to risk death for someone who'd rather see him or her dead seems ludicrous. But if, if combatants don't take those risks, then the war goes on, or worse, ends in defeat. Therefore, what we need is a basis for obligating combatant risk that reconciles the tension between the requirements of regular warfare and its, with its limited aims in hostile populations. Now, this will be something of a contentious uh, uh, point, I think, and good for questions. Uh, but according to a, a recent RAND study, successful regular warfare is often characterized by positive cooperating building efforts that build government legitimacy, provide basic services, and support economic development. In addition to kinetic operations, uh, detentions and population control measures. That point doesn't, this point doesn't suggest a particular priority for these practices, which I'll argue is very context sensitive, and that's one reason it's kind of hard to nail down a particular enduring narrative for any particular regular war, because they're all different, and we can talk about that uh, uh, later as well. But it does su suggest an expansion on the kinds of practices combatants may be obligated to accept risk in order to accomplish. Take, for example, the uh, mission that D Corporal Dakota Myers was on when he earned his Medal of Honor, 
which was delivering generators to a village that had requested them. Essentially, they were ordered into a hostile area in order to accomplish a humanitarian mission. In fact, as it turned out, the Taliban had used that cooperation between the villagers and U.S. forces as an opportunity to set up an ambush. In fact, there may have been culpability, perhaps coerced, perhaps not, on the part of the villagers in setting up the ambush. However, when the troops in contact called for supporting fires so that they could disengage, they were denied by their higher headquarters. It was denied by their higher headquarters out of fear of civilian casualties, and as a result, they took several. Now, setting aside the concern about civilian casualties, which I'm going to discuss next, examples like this leave us with a question: How much risk must combatants assume to encourage cooperation of a hostile and or, or at best indifferent population? Answering this question requires us to recall that the risk transfer between soldier and citizen is indirect. Even in regular war, when combatants defend a particular order and social, particular political and social order, in regular war, combatants defend a, poli a particular political and social order, not individual citizens. Thus, to make a long story short, what enables the responsibility to protect is the citizens' participation in that order. So when citizens participate in that order, combatants are positively obligated to protect them, which can include addressing humanitarian concerns. However, when they do not, their responsibility is simply to avoid harm. However, regular warfare is also largely fought, however, in that transition space where, the pop where you're moving the population slowly from hostile to cooperative, or at least preventing further drift from cooperative to hostile. This point suggests that some risk is unavoidable. However, it also suggests that in any particular case, combatants would be permitted to prior prioritize their safety over any particular task though they would be obligated to address those conditions that gave rise to that risk in the first place. Kind of here I'm drawing on the work of Israeli philosopher Asa Kasher, who argues that soldiers have the same rights as civilians. Uh, and while they may take on risks, may be required to take on risks that on behalf of friendly civilians, they don't have to on behalf of hostile ones. Now, he uses that logic to argue for rules of regular war in, uh, in, in, in irregular conflicts. I think, uh, I, I think it's better to look at, uh, so I think he's right that soldiers don't lose rights, which is uh, a feature of some model, uh, just war models. Uh, and I would agree that combatants do not have to take more risk. That does not entail a permission to place more risk on the civilians. Rather, I think you have to start looking at alternatives and consider the necessity of the particular operation in place. So maybe the requirement to do something doesn't go away, but you, you, there is a requirement to seek alternatives uh, that don't, the, 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 to, to, seek, to seek alternatives uh, rather than displacing risk on the non-combatants. Now I want to look at um, placing uh, risk onto non-combatants in regular warfare, uh, sort of that junction of force protection versus non-combatant immunity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the inseparability of civilian activity from adversary activity, the diversity of relationships between combatants and non-combatants, and the requirements to transform these relationships means that lethal force may not always be morally appropriate, even against adversaries. That sounds odd, but for example, early in the Iraq war, we found that even very discriminated attacks against clearly identifiable insurgent targets had the effect of enabling cultural norms associated with revenge that broadened the reasons that individual Iraqis would have for attacking coalition forces, or at least opposing a coalition presence. In such a context, it sometimes made sense to avoid such killing until we had developed sufficient relations within that community to address the threat the insurgency activity posed without generating greater animosity. These same factors bring into question the principle that non-combatants should be immune from any harm, especially the kind of non-lethal harm such as deceit and coercion, which are often associated with successful counterinsurgency strategies. Uh, recalling the successful British campaign against the Boers, uh, despite the unintended horror that the Kirchner's concentration camps came, became, um, which was more due to logistics than intent, um, his ability to separate the Boer population from his fighters was a major contributing factor to the victory. Similarly, even though the strategic hamlet program, which resulted in the forced relocation of thousands of Vietnamese villagers, uh, maybe universally wasn't a success, but where it worked, it worked well. And further, where it worked well, it represented an improvement in security and governments and living conditions, even though the villagers would arguably have preferred to stay home. My point here is not to justify the abuses associated with these programs, nor does it underplay the difficulty population control programs entail. Rather, I just want to briefly sketch out a moral framework for engaging such measure. Regular warfare assimilates liability harm into classes of persons, which determines the permissions, obligations, and prohibitions of the use of force. And it's this assimilation that gives us the classes of military and civilian that drives much of the regular war effort. But again, drawing on Michael Walzer, making someone liable to be harmed based on their membership in a particular class of persons, whether that class is national, ethnic, or even functional, is precisely what terrorists do. 
So while maintaining this distinction is the best we can do in regular war, it risks reducing both sides to an uncomfortable moral equivalency in irregular war. Now, drawing on, the ethic, uh, on John Rawls, um, uh, we can resolve this discomfort by employing an ethic of fairness that respects persons based on their consent. Now, I know what you're saying. At first blush, uh, it might seem counterintuitive to apply an ethic of fairness in war, which, in which, as the old saying goes, all is fair. However, the fairness principle is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a common feature in a lot of adversarial accounts of adversarial ethics, as it captures a number of important moral int intuitions which are often useful in resolving the normative dil dilemmas of a regular war. More importantly, it provides a useful framework for aligning our actions with our narrative, which begins with the just political order, which is a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for success. Because first, it recognizes that persons can consent to treatment they prefer not to experience. Uh, simple example is the game of football. I would prefer not to be tackled. I'm short. It hurts a lot. Uh, but the rules of the game say that if I play and I get, grab the ball, uh, such assault is, uh, is absolutely fair. In fact, I would have agreed to the possibility just by virtue of playing the game. To insist that I was not subject to, these, to, to such a possibility would be a form of free riding, which the fairness principle doesn't tolerate. Second, related to the first, it broadens the kinds of persons who may be targeted in some fashion, but in a way that constrains that targeting. Um, and they're being commensurate with the role they play. Again, football provides a, a good illustration. You can tackle the guy with the ball, but you can't, and, and not really anyone else, but you can block, which also involves hitting, someone to prevent him from tackling your player with the ball. Um, so while I'm really trying to say, in, in discussing the issue of fairness, and this cartoon is basically to illustrate that at some point, you shouldn't cheat on your, you know, don't be Calvin and don't cheat on your ethics test. And war is often an ethics test. Uh, and while it's beyond the scope to fully spell out all the obligations that a fairness, the, the fairness principle might employ, uh, put simply, norms associated with the fairness principle follow a one-for-one -one exchange with liabilities. Fairness is nothing else, both discriminant and proportionate. Those who kill should expect to be killed. Those who coerce and deceive should expect to be coerced and deceived. Finally, those whose actions enable the adversary cause should be expected to be prevented from engaging in those acts, even if that interferes with other aspects of their lives and have nothing to do with the war. It's important to note that harms justified by fairness are not retributive. Rather, responding harms are justified by the fact they are necessary to bring about a just and thus fair order. This point suggests that we need to introduce a new category of adversary, namely non-combatant adversaries, which would include collaborators, supporters, and sympathizers, who may not be subject to lethal harms, but should be subject to other measures. Now, uh, what I haven't done yet is account fully for uh, the collateral harms that um, uh, uh, collateral harms to people who have no liability uh, based on their relationship to the insurgency. Nor have I really talked about um, uh, engaging. Uh, uh, nor have I really talked about the case of when troops are under fire and the only way to get them out is to. Uh, provide indirect, you know, casually produ uh, civilian casualty producing indirect fire. Uh, and to that point, the fair, what the fairness principle will tell you, and I'm going to kind of wrap it up here, is uh, it's fair to avoid outcomes where one person is uh, worse off, even if others are better off. Uh, kind of the paradigm example of that is, you guys are familiar with Bernard Williams, Jim and the uh, evil dictator, where he, Jim, well, he, li Jim he, lines up 20, he lines up 20 locals and tells Jim, you shoot one or I shoot all of them. The purpose of the example is to show the limits of utilitarian thinking, but it also illustrates an important point about fairness, where if Jim shoots the one person, you can make the argument that no one is worse off and everyone else is better off. So it provides a framework in which Jim can act fairly, even though the situation in which the dictator is put him has, uh, is itself not fair. And so while war may not be fair, it doesn't entail that one can't and one shouldn't act fairly in war, and it provides a framework in which to make those decisions. Um, now, regarding um, when, why we shouldn't, or the, 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 the times when uh, uh, indirect fire support is necessarily to break contact and to save soldiers' lives, where uh, this would not help you there, because it would still entail uh, one person being worse off and more being better off. I mean, not as, even though more better off. Um, and here we put the li rights to life of both the soldier and civilian squarely against each other. And since both involve imperatives, our framework really doesn't offer an obvious solution. However, since soldiers continue to enjoy their right to life, I think it's permissible to provide fire support 
but only to facilitate disengagement, which would be the measure of the least force possible. It would be disingenuous to do so in a way that causes harm excessive to that, even in service to legitimate military objectives. Otherwise, we risk another Ben Trey. So in conclusion, basically what I'm arguing is a reorientation of how one considers the use of force in a regular warfare, which would include a preference for non-lethal me measures over lethal, uh, which includes developing a situation to consider a range of measures before acting, but not being afraid to use lethal force against armed insurgents, but when lethal force is necessary, limiting it to the least possible to accomplish the immediate goal. Uh, avoiding foreseen harms, but permitting foreseen risks, and being, conscious, uh, and being conscious of the political, social, and cultural context in which force is used, ensuring it aligns with a narrative of fairness that brings people to your cause, not drives them away. Um, and uh, so what does that say for our, uh, our, our case studies? Well, the first couple, I think they got it right. Uh, they were able to secure fellow Marines, uh, but avoided harm to non-combatants. I think in the second examples, I think they got it wrong, where the NCO we talked about in the beginning should have received uh, uh, indirect fire, certainly should have seen illumination rounds and, and, uh, uh, and smoke rounds. So that fits the, that, that's a perfect example of the definition of unintended, uh, of foreseen risk as opposed to foreseen harm. Uh, and now as far as the third example, Ben Trey, I think, as, we said, as I said before, that, that was likely excessive. Uh, though other Vietnam era programs such as Strategic Hamlet and Operation Phoenix uh, would probably be permitted even though they had issues with their impl uh, implementation which we can talk about. But ultimately it kind of leaves us with a question that John left us with yesterday which was at some point, um, uh, you know, I, at some point war is going to force a decision where if I'm not, restraint comes from a position of strength. It comes from, uh, uh, and when you're frustrated uh, when you aren't able to have success, then the pressure to escalate force increases. And that's a tension that's, you just can't, that, that's very difficult uh, to make go away. Um, and what I would say in those situations, in a regular warfare, uh, you just, it, it, it is to refer to that orientation, think in terms of the least force permissible in order to get, in order to get the conflict back under control uh, and, uh, 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 and create the space you need for closing that gap between your military objectives and your political ones. And I'm going to, I'm right at 45, I'm gonna stop talking and open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Colonel Pfaff. Uh, an extremely judicious uh, but intensive uh, tour of uh, the differences between regular and irregular warfare and the special dilemmas, uh, ethical dilemmas of irregular warfare. Uh, we'll start opening up for questions. I can't see the name, but if you, right there, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, George Haldeman from Miskuda High School. Um, you know, people are always trying to make connections uh, between like the Vietnam War and the current war going on in the Middle East. I was just curious, what was your opinion, like what connections, you know, are there and what would you say would be some of the differences then in these conflicts? That's a really good question. I, I think in terms of, in terms of the internal dynamics, I think you can, you can draw a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, we were, you know, it was really a lot more, at least in South Vietnam, it was a lot more about um, uh, building cooperation towards a particular political order uh, and undermining cooperation with another, with the, with the alternative, um, which is a different kind of objective than, you know, uh, than your, 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 your regular war objective. And in Iraq, it was the same kind of thing where, um, you know, we're trying to build cooperation towards a particular, we're trying to build cooperation towards a particular government as opposed to a particular order, as opposed to, uh, you know, simply, you know, crushing the Iraqi armed forces. So the victory conditions, in a sense, were similar. Uh, that's kind of where it breaks down from there. Uh, I think in terms of, that's one thing about irregular warfare, is the narrative, you know, I really think the narrative matters. Uh, and the narratives were very different. Uh, in the Vietnam War, it was a, you know, uh, it was, it was a, you know, basically a Cold War template. Uh, we were there to defeat communists who oppress. Uh, and they were there to defeat, you know, they were there to uh, remove a corrupt government. Uh, or, you know, it's, these are just elements. I don't have a fully spelled out narrative. The Iraq War was a lot more complicated uh, because there's multiple, there were multiple and competing narratives, and I don't think we ever really got a control over that. Uh, you know, to the Sunnis, uh, 
you know, they, they saw, you know, hi, we're from Washington, we're here to help. Uh, we're gonna, you know, uh, uh, you know, and bow to your Persian masters. Uh, our Persian, the Persian masters saw, you know, the U.S. increasing its influence, and uh, and, and they, uh, and so that entered the narrative, and so they pushed back on that, and it became really, today with a three-way fight is uh, is, is uh, probably simplifying it too much. So I think in the details, very different, but in terms of the larger, you know, vict set of victory conditions, I think there's some similarities. Uh, John Underwood. Great talk, sir. I really enjoyed it. Um, with the beginning of the war, if we'd have taken maybe a more long-term approach as opposed to just win democracy and get out, you know, if we could actually have ever done that and done, because you can't really put the same set of standards on two different conflicts, but with what did work with the strategic Hamlet program and with what the Salute Stouts did with the Rhodesian Civil War of you know, you capture an enemy combatant, then you bring him and his entire family in your village, and you feed them, and you shelter them, and then you give them a job, and then he goes right back out with you on your next patrol with a weapon that, of course, isn't loaded, and said, let's go now find your friends. Would that maybe have taken a more long-term approach, might have, well, I won't say solved the problem, but maybe sent us down a different road that we might be at today? Uh, that's another really good question. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm only... I, I, I know a little bit. I know a bit about the Strategic Hamlet program. Um, that's certainly the kind of dynamic you want to encourage. Uh, the challenge you have is that you know there's a lot of studies on this. There's no it's make it the link between uh, these kinds of pos, you know positive, particularly socially uh, uh, things that target social issues and social needs. Uh, they seem to have an important role to play, but they're not always definitive in terms of the outcome. So I'm sure it's just as many, so, so the other, so the short answer is that's great if that dynamic's working, but that dynamic doesn't always work. Uh, now, as far as the long-term approach goes, that's a great question, because now you've got to tie it into the political will of the United States. And then, then my answer is, what's our investment? Uh, and that's really more a practical concern. Uh, but I, what I would say is that pro approach would certainly conform to the kind of ethic that I'm talking about and a way out of the dilemmas that would arise otherwise if you employed a four-centric approach. Uh, Gary Morris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a couple of questions. Excellent presentation, um, as have all the presentations so far. Uh, my first question is this. How do you deal with a group that is willing to sacrifice the entire population to win um, when you go in to fight a, a war? And in looking at that kind of a situation, then how does that shape the United States military objectives and political objectives in the future when we go into these kind of conflicts as we've seen in Afghanistan and Iraq? with individuals that are willing to sacrifice the entire population to win. Yeah, toughy. Um, so I think, the, for, you know, if I were making decisions about whether or not to, you know, because you asked a couple of good questions, it's, it's, not just, it's not just what do I do when I get there, it's, you know, how does, in fact, my decision to go there in the first place? And I think that's important. And basically, I want to rather, I, I, I can't make the calculation based on, uh, you know, on, on some, you know, one or two international norms, or just a, a simple conception of rights, or my capability to achieve it, uh, I think I have to look at the whole narrative of what's going to account for my actions and make my actions intelligible, uh, and try to assess whether, in that cultural and social context in which it's going to take place, is it going to work. That's our problem in Iraq. We don't have that narrative yet. You know, every narrative we adopt it alienates somebody else and drives them to fight. Um, so. I think you should think about that before you start, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and that should, in fact, your decision about whether or not to try it in the first place. Because I think there's a good argument made. Not all of these, you know, really, do, not all of these actions that we're engaged in may not tie to a core U.S. interest, and I think that's fair to. Now, in terms of when I get there, what do I do? This is a, this is again goes back to John's talk, you know, the Jap because his argument, uh, you know, is basically that's what the Japanese were doing, right? I mean, the thing he. Uh, uh, I mean, one reason that the, the area bombing took place is because they dispersed the munitions factories and the military, you know, the military airplane factories and all that throughout the civilian population. That's why, unlike, so unlike the Germans where you could, 
reasonably discriminately target those. You couldn't do that in Japan. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get at, at the end. When you're losing, you get desperate, you break the rules. Uh, when you're winning, the only way when you're winning are you really in a position to uphold the rules. And that's the ethical question. Uh, what line, you know, where, uh, uh, and this is, a, this, is a, by the way, this is a psychological, not a moral argument. I'm not saying you should do this, but that's your question. That's your dilemma is when things aren't going my way and the only way I can figure out is to violate the rules, how important are these rules to me? And that's your, that, you know, that's ultimately that's the ethical question. In this case, um, uh, you know, ISIL centers are a good example, right? Where, you know, they're literally holding these guys hostage, uh, or a lot of major elements of the population hostage. And then so that's how I would look at it. You know, it's a, if, it's, if, if, if they're, you know, what would a hostage taker do? And it's, a, it's an analogy and a metaphor, but I would start trying to think through that and figure out uh, courses of action that I could, uh, that I could take. And this kind of goes back to my point of uh, actions that are, uh, you know, make no one worse off, I mean, make no one worse off and someone better off, uh, where, because uh, one of the, what, a tactic technique and procedure of hostage taking is shoot the host if it looks like they're about to kill the hostage, shoot the hostage in the leg so you can get a shot at the hostage taker. Uh, and the hostage is not worse off. In fact, the hostage is better off. Uh, so I would look for measures like that, uh, and uh, and uh, still with that idea of the least force possible, rather than treating it as a regular conflict where um, you just you do what you know you, you do massive damage. Over there, I, your name escapes me. Good morning, Colonel. Thank you for your service and your insights this morning. Sean Connor from Towson University. In regular warfare. Part of our success and the goals and objectives that we've set out for ourselves is more of a, a quantitative data analysis through battle damage assessments, the seizure of men and material and territory and so forth. In a regular warfare, it moves into a much more qualitative type of analysis. Can you speak to how the command apparatus, um, what types of data they're looking for, how they gather that data, and then use it to complete their analysis as to the success of the mission? Great question. I think we'll get right on that. Um, the, the, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, regular warfare is, it's, you know, any attrition-based strategy, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out, maybe hard to achieve, don't get me wrong, uh, but pretty easy to figure out what I got to do. I got to decrease his force capability faster than he decreases mine. The other one's a lot harder. Uh, and I think if you don't have some kind of, um, you know, story again, if you don't have, if you, if you, if you don't have a understanding of that route between the military objective and the political one, how you get from here to there, how that language of force impacts that, it's hard to make those assessments. Now, to have that, you absolutely have to have the social, cultural, and political information. And that's the hard part, right? Because a lot of that, you know, I, I was in DIA when all this started. I, I was in the J2 of the uh, Chairman Joint Chiefs uh, as the political military guy for the Iraq Intelligence Task Force. Uh, and they were asking questions that we just couldn't answer uh, because we didn't have, Iraq was very isolated. We did not have a lot of local knowledge. Uh, and it took years to actually, you know, after, you know, after the invasion, it took us years to build that. So um, I think we're probably in a better position to figure out what that is. Uh, the broad categories are political, social, and cultural down to the local level. Uh, how you assess that depends on your, how you've assessed your getting from the military objective to the political. Uh, and once you've figured all that out, I think you've got a pretty good framework for moving forward and making judgments. Sure. Uh, Ami Parkash. Hi, thank you, Colonel, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about three categories that you raised about to, to describe the population. Um, hostile, cooperating, and then the new category that you proposed, the, the non-combatant adversary. Um, and essentially my question is, is that, you know, if the goal of sort of coin operations is to make sure that cooperating populations do not go into the hostile category and the strategy is to then sift through the population, which can then involve, as you, as you suggested, perhaps forcible resettlement. Um, does that not risk alienating those cooperating populations just by virtue of the action itself of forcible resettlement? Good question. Um, and and you're going to hate me for, you know, I hate to say it depends, uh, which is my favorite answer. It's, it's, it's the first thing you learn in philosophy school. Um, 
But yeah, but you're asking the right question because ultimately that's the measure, right? And so you, it kind of goes back to your question. It's how do I assess my actions? Uh, and so, uh, and my point is, is that, you know, you have to look at what, what makes those actions intelligible to the population. And in that case, you know, some things that are inconvenient, some things that disrupt social and civil life can be tolerated depending on the, you know, depending on how you're presenting yourself uh, and the story of why you're there. On the, but on the other hand, it does suggest there's an obligation to continually assess that, ensuring you're disrupting just enough to separate these insurgents from the population. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so uh, it does suggest you have to build resilience to any kind of program uh, that, well, if it does have that effect, that you, you, you've anticipated it uh, and can adjust your actions accordingly. And if you give me an example, maybe I could, you know, spell that out a little bit better for you. But, um, you know, in terms of Iraq, you know, Iraq's actually a pretty good example. You know, we, we went in, we're here to liberate. You know, we're, we're here to, uh, you know, we are, you know, and we're here to bring democratic reforms and plug you back into the uh, international community, which is basically what we tried to do. However, uh, as the insurgency grew, uh, uh, we took actions that weren't in line with that, um, you know, with that, that, with that, with that narrative. We did adjust. It just took a long time. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and when we adjusted, we figured out ways to bring that cooperation back. So it, it's, not, it's not a static thing. It's something you have to pay attention to, and there's never one thing that you can do. But I take your point that you know, it's absolutely something you have to pay attention to. Uh, Javier Guet. I'm struck by uh, the centrality of narratives in your account and, and the need to uh, put it within a narrative that uh, makes sense to us, makes sense to, to the people we're trying to affect. Um, that makes, uh, it makes complete sense now that you've suggested. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, what, what about the um, tension that it seems to exist between narratives that make sense to apparently the majority of our population with regards to uh, our, our exceptionalism uh, as a nation, the need to maintain primacy over the world in terms of power, and our need to actually show our population that we are tougher than anybody else. And uh, the proof of that is that uh, if somebody uh, makes trouble, uh, we, uh, we should not be um, apologizing uh, or diplomacy or any of that sort, but rather uh, you know, kick some behind. Um, that, that's the, the narrative that seems to be uh, perhaps I inevitable and, and necessary domestically, uh, and I'm thinking of the Middle East uh, and the narratives that make sense to them, the, the, uh, their, their religious commitment to Islamic values and, and Islamic law, uh, their, uh, what we otherwise in, in, in previous ages stood up for, the, the, the wish for self-determination. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, the tension between Israel and, and the uh, Islamic Arab countries. Uh, how is it possible to reconcile those narratives? And isn't that, if, if that, is, that tension is irreconcilable, is, is that an argument for basically for us to not do much more in that area? Yeah, this one will be easy to answer. It's a great question. Because uh, I, I, honestly, I'd, I'd, I'd argue yes. Uh, and um, uh, but, but, but to amplify that, um, the, uh, so, we do this every day. I mean, so aligning these narratives is what we call where I work Tuesday. Um, and, uh, you know, this, and so when we're talking about forming policy, so I have a very practical answer to your question. When we're talking about forming policy, uh, you know, we talk about, we think about the messages. We think about what, you know, how it's going to be received, not just to the, you know, to the enemy, but also to our friends and also to our domestic audiences. Uh, and, uh, we're, you know, uh, the, the, I think the, the problem with the system sometimes is that analysis occurs in a stovepipe uh, where one agency is working, you know, you know, sees it from one point of view, State Department looks at it from one point of view, Department of Defense looks at it from another point of view. Now, there is an interagency process, and what I'm, I guess what I would argue that we could do better is uh, sp specifically coordinating these messages at the inter interagency level uh, in all three ways. Advers you know, enemy, you know, bad guy, friends, family, uh, and, and, and lining it that way. And I'd argue if I really can't figure out how to line that up or I'm not confident in that analysis, I really should, had, I should think twice about before I act. Uh, so I, I totally take that point. Uh, 
James Tucker. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I uh, wrote down, you said restraint comes from a position's strength. And um, so I guess my question is, with regard to ethical dilemmas, do, do ethics at the end of the day even matter or only when it is still competitive? And I, I kind of, to narrow it, are ethics a privilege of the strong? That's, a, yeah, yeah, I mean, that was sort of what I was teeing up with that point. Uh, so that's, a, that you, 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 you've got it. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of literature, uh, uh, and Walter covers this in Just and Unjust Wars, for those of you who use that, uh, you know, where uh, uh, you know, there is a defense dilemma of sorts where as long as you're winning, it's easy to be restrained. And once you start losing, uh, to the extent those restraints are in, you think are in the way, uh, they, uh, you know, you, 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 re, you, you, you get rid of them. Now, what he will tell you is, all right, he has this doctrine of supreme emergency. And what he says in those kinds of situations, when the alternative is some great catastrophe, like, you know, and he's thinking World War II, enslavement by the Nazis, uh, then you're permitted to override the normal restraints in order to uh, ensure this great catastrophe doesn't happen. Basically, he says when the state, basically he's saying when the stakes are really, 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 really high, uh, that consequentialist utilitarian ethic, you know, trumps. And consequent preventing that uh, matters. Now, there's some, uh, you can make some rights-based arguments, too. Uh, so the problem for a lot of the examples we talked about yesterday uh, and today is that we're not in a supreme emergency. Um, you know, particularly the, the Japanese example of yesterday was, you know, we were winning. Uh, but we were trying to prevent the deaths of a lot of other people uh, uh, and uh, uh, of our folks. And so we can, I don't want to talk about that, but so that would fail this doctrine of supreme emergency. You'd have to come up with another justification for it. Now, in terms of irregular warfare, it's very hard to argue supreme emergency, though, uh, you know, ISIL might make a case because they really are representing something that's, uh, repre you know, something that this is not a popular liberation movement. This is, these guys are, uh, you know, or representing the worst of human rights abuses. And they may justify something like that, maybe not from our perspective, but certainly the people who are subject to, uh, 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 to, to that enslavement. Uh, but to answer your question, that's the ethical question. When things aren't going well, what are you going to do? Uh, there'll be a lot of pressure for you to override those rules uh, and uh, move forward. And uh, my response would be I would resist that. Uh, I would look for other ways. Uh, and then, you know, I look for other ways uh, to um, uh, achieve my ends. And if that fails, I don't know. We, you know, I don't know what I do. We have uh, we have time for one more question. If there is any Art Seer. I really learned a lot from your remarks. Thank you very much, Colonel. The wider ge geographic context, including the political geography, successful efforts against insurgencies seem historically to be in cases where um, the, the insurgents and the population can be uh, really segregated. That is something you alluded to, I think, in your comments on the Strategic Hamlet program. The British in Malaya, the British, uh, the Americans in the Philippines, the British in Northern Ireland, interestingly enough, even though there was a reasonably hostile power across the border, there were strong incentives, including economic incentives, not to intervene. Um, to what extent do you, in your central policy work today, uh, attend to these considerations along with your colleagues? It didn't seem to me that you addressed that directly in your comments. Uh, Iran in what used to be Iraq would be another example of our frustration is to a significant degree, I think, a function of their uh, ability to intervene, which Richard Nixon uh, warned about in one of his most important books, Beyond Peace, way back in 1994, Don't Invade Iraq. <laughs> um, to answer the question, it's, it's to what extent does the uh, Civilian support for the population, I mean, for, for the insurgency, enter into thinking regarding how to deal with the insurgency? I was thinking more of geography and literally of geography. Oh. Oh. Um, yeah. Well, I, 
in terms of implementation, I would say it figures dramatically. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, I mean, certainly in Iraq, uh, uh, that was the case. Now, the, the issue that we have is often we, don't, we can't cover it all, at least not at the levels that you really need to in order to, uh, in order to be effective. Uh, that's something that we tend, to, uh, we tend to struggle with. So I would say we do. Uh, we've gotten better at it. Uh, but in terms of our ability to have that impact, it just depends on, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on how close we are to that particular culture and how well we understand it or how the interlocutors we're working with are able to communicate. Uh, and then uh, do we have the resources to actually cover that, you know, cover the space that you're talking about? And those are the kind of challenges there. I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.